Good morning, great to be with you again. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah chapter one. Uh, or in your app. If you don't have a Bible, we have one for you. In the foyer after service, we would love for you to be able to uh, take one home with you. Have you ever experienced a time in your life where you felt things were beyond repair? Maybe that's something that is physical. Maybe that's something that's more relational. We've had uh, some demo in our house due to some uh, toilets flooding, and uh, it's been a lot, (laughs) but nothing compared to the time that we took a team down to Houston in 2017. I remember after Hurricane Harvey had hit, we went down and uh, helped a church group uh, that was just organizing missions teams to come down and help uh, demolish and, 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 and take people's homes apart, essentially. But I can't imagine seeing all the pictures and we drove through these communities where literally everything had to be ripped out of these homes. And it seemed, is it worth it? Should we just pack up and and move? Uh, And we got to be the hands and feet of of the Lord in a sense, loving people and going and helping them uh, tear their house down to the studs, uh, get dehumidifiers and and start to dry their homes out and then rebuild uh, these homes. And we didn't have... uh, every skilled laborer on our team, but we had willing spirits and hands, and so we were able to uh, hang sheetrock and make a really big dent in in the repair for some of these folks. This is the the work that's going on here in Nehemiah, something that seemed like it could never happen, and the Israelites were longing for God's promise of restoration to come to fruition, and they're a generation away from the people who were warned that they were gonna have 70 years and and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that they were gonna be experiencing God's discipline. And so you can imagine this people beginning to see a remnant come back to the nation of Israel that is this really gonna take place? And they come back and the temple's destroyed and burned down and disrepair. How in the world are we gonna get through this? How are we going to rebuild and renew our community. And that's the big idea for our message throughout the book of Nehemiah is that we're gonna experience how Nehemiah led this rebuilding and renewal process for their community. He, as a person, offers us a great example of living with conviction and also strategic intention. He organized his life in a manner that he was able to accomplish the goals that he set before him. I think like Nehemiah, we as Christians need to walk by faith in the dark times that we live in. See, Nehemiah was sure of who God was. He acted with God and for God, even though that meant great effort, strenuous effort on his part. Nehemiah, we'll read, addresses the spiritual compromise that was welcomed both outside of their community and inside their spiritual community, not only to rebuild the walls of the city, but to rebuild the convictions of the people. And all of this was aimed to renew their spiritual devotion and worship to a worthy and a holy God. See, your heart is in the process of rebuilding each and every one of you, as you have experienced the good news of the gospel, that you have found that the living God is yes alive and that his word is alive and can transform us, we're experiencing this renewal and rebuilding. We call it progressive sanctification. And God offers each and every one of us bright hope when we look at a situation and say, this can't be fixed. This can't be rebuilt or renewed. See, he offers fresh starts and new beginnings. And Nehemiah, the people of Israel, are given a fresh start. The challenge that they're gonna have, and we're gonna have as well, is after giving that fresh start, how do we follow through on living in right relationship with God? But I want us to hear from the beginning that this morning, our big idea is because of God, you can experience a spiritual rebuilding and renewal. 
Because of our great God, you can experience that. And we're gonna read uh, chapter one this morning and we're gonna see that Nehemiah has great, deep affection for God and for his people. But before we dive into the text, I wanna give you a little bit of the historical background, some information that will find helpful for us as we read this book. First, note that Nehemiah most often is really read as one book that's paired with the book of Ezra. And so if you read Torah, Ezra and Nehemiah is a singular book. And that's because it's really a, a singular story that runs through and written by different people, but historically it's all happening together. And so if we understand the, the hist- history of Israel, we'll know that uh, the fall of Judah happened when the Babylonians came in and they conquered them, they took them captive, and they took all of them out of their land. And this can be uh, read about in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And then we see the decree of Cyrus come, um, and that is, uh, can even be noted in the book of Daniel, where he gives permission essentially for the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. He'll give a subsidy, he'll fund, say, yet yeah, you can go back, and Cyrus is the king of Persia. So Babylon, who conquered Israel, brings all the Israelites out. Then Cyrus comes as the Persian king, and he conquers them. And this is important because it will help us just come off the heels of the book of Esther, knowing that the temple's been given a commission to rebuild, and all the while, Esther is taking place. See, Cyrus captured Babylon in 539 B.C. The temple begins rebuilding in 516 B.C., And in the 400s, we see that Esther goes before King Ahasuerus or King Xerxes. So just to run down the the, um, order of kings for the, the, the kingdom of Persia for a moment, Cyrus ruled for 29 years, and he was the conqueror. He, he brought the kingdom of Persia to great fame, great notoriety, and organized. And then uh, there's a couple other kings that come before him. Uh, King uh, Cambyses, he was only for seven years. Uh, Smyrdis, he was only for less than one year, poor guy. Darius served as the king of Persia for 35 years. And then Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, which is the king that ruled in Esther, he ruled for 20 years. And the king that we're going to see here in Nehemiah is Artaxerxes, and he rules for about 40 years. So just to kind of give you some context of what's going on, and they're going to throw a map up here for you. I know it's small and hard to read, but you can kind of see in the green highlighted portion, this is the extent of the Persian Empire at the time of Nehemiah, just to give you some context. So Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar. The people had been taken captive and Babylon had grown and then Persia comes in, they wipe out Babylon. And if you like history, you'll find that there's some amazing things that take place in all of the developments of one empire conquering another empire. The Babylonians were were just wicked people. They were having this great feast and celebration in Susa, and the Persians, ironically, they're really smart. Uh, they decided to essentially build this offshoot lake that would bring the river table down that would enter into the city of Cyrus so that they could sneak under and overthrow the city. And so they did that while the Babylonians were partying, partying and there's historical events, or records that show that the Babylonians had no idea that most of the city had been conquered by the time that the Persians had come in. And so, sure enough, they take over, and Cyrus decrees that people can go back and they can worship where they'd like, and we heard of that in the book of Esther. And he authorized the subsidization of a rebuilding in the temple of Jerusalem. We'll read about that in the book of Ezra, chapter one, verses one through four, as well as chapter six, three through five, that he gives them permission to go back. And so the story of Ezra, Ezra goes back and tries to reinvigorate the people to rebuild the temple so that they can worship with God, interact with God, and begin to to, to grow in their devotion. And that's about 5,000 people that come together for that. And so then the temple is rebuilt in the book of Ezra, chapters 3 through 6. But the people didn't quite respond well at the book at the end of the book of Ezra. They, they didn't sustain their spiritual walk and they experienced great threats from outside the city. See, the walls were, were broken down and the gates had been burnt and so there was real 
uh, there was no real protection for them. And so as we begin Nehemiah, about 40,000 Israelites are going to return back to Jerusalem at this point. So a much larger returning remnant comes back. And we're going to see that Nehemiah is going to lead this rebuilding and lead this renewal. So there's a couple of major themes that we can see in the story of Nehemiah that will be really helpful for us to kind of unpack and, and, and understand. The first six chapters, we're really going to begin to see God's faithfulness to Israel. A people who had disobeyed that God told you you were going to experience difficulty and calamity, but we're going to restore you. We're going to bring you back. And they experience God's provision in that. Even in a simple thing like a king from a foreign religion saying, we're going to subsidize your ability to rebuild the temple. We also see that there's going to be a covenant renewal. There's a renewal of the people's vigor and covenant and promise that we're going to honor God and obey God. And they recommit themselves or rededicate themselves as God's people to God's ways. And then we'll see in, in chapter 11 and 12, there's a renewing the spirit of worship. Spirit of worship is they delight in God, they celebrate God, they remember all that God has done, they feast, they'll celebrate feasts that Israelites continue to celebrate today in the Feast of Booths. And then we'll see the book kind of ends on a little bit of a downer, and it's a great warning for us, because we'll see this theme that God's people need to be on guard against their own moral weakness. Each of us is at risk for discrediting God's word and authority and missing out on delighting in the worship of God. And so we'll see in chapter one, Nehemiah is gonna receive this report and he'll respond in prayer. So we're gonna see three things in the text this morning. We'll see the report, we'll see Nehemiah's response, and we'll see Nehemiah's request. So I know that's a lot to, to dive into this morning, but let's, let's take a look here at the text now, finally, um, and we'll see chapter one. If we throw that map up real quick, uh, just to point out, uh, you'll see this little red line. So all the way over on the right um, is Susa, and that's where Nehemiah is when he reads this message, gets this report of what's taking place in Jerusalem, which that red line kind of marks how he travels and gets there all the way over by the Mediterranean Sea. So to give you some historical and geographical context for what's going on and where it's happening, this is where it's at. So follow along as I read verse one, chapter one. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I, saw, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hin and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire." As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before God, or the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statues, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your dispersed be under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. 
Oh, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. Let's pray as we've read God's word this morning. Thank you, Father, for Nehemiah who writes this account that we may see your goodness your covenant love, your enduring faithfulness to a people who indeed have sinned against you. Lord, like the Israelites whose hearts wander, we too wander. And I pray that you would help us to see that you are a God who can rebuild and renew. We pray this in your name, amen. So Nehemiah receives this report. Some Jews had escaped and survived exile. The challenge is in verse three, if you look with me, it says that they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. And so this, these people are facing great difficulty to just function as God's people, to worship, to, to meet in the temple without being afraid, to be embarrassed, to, to not necessarily follow God's commands. The book of Ezra lets us know that even though the temple is rebuilt, the people's hearts aren't really aligned towards God's commands. Nehemiah understands the Torah. He understands the law that Moses was given and how God gave Moses instructions and in how they were able to relate and have right relationship with God. And the people have rejected that law and are not obeying it. And thus, they've been dispersed. And so the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. The gates destroyed by fire. And here's some things that stick out. In verse four, he says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Do you know what this response reminds us of? Just not that far off when we read the book of Esther. is Mordecai's response to the decree that went out that the Jews were gonna be obliterated. He responds in the same way. And here we get to see Nehemiah not subvertly imply that he was worshiping the Lord, but overtly telling us that he lamented and fell prostrate before an almighty God. That he understood the situation in which they were in. He understood why they were there. Why the, the temple had been destroyed. Why they had to rebuild it. Why the gates had been burnt down and the walls crumbled. He understood, and he took responsibility for this. See, when we mourn our existing state, we begin the process of rebuilding and renewal. If we ignore it, if we just say, I'm not gonna deal with that, guess what? You'll never get to experience victory over that issue. Now, this is a book that is written for a very corporate mindset. It is the sins of the people. And I think that's important for us not to miss out on. As an individualistic society, I could read this and I could rightly apply, I need to make sure that I am owning my sin, that I am responsible for what has gone on. In our household, we kind of use this, this phrase, name it and claim it. If you can't name your sin and claim your sin, you can't find victory over it. And so if we ignore it and try to just pretend it doesn't exist, the problem continues to go on and on and on. Guess what? That's true for us as a people. And this book is written to a group of people. And so for us as the church, and we read this response, are we collectively in a state of brokenness that we aren't willing to acknowledge? As, are, are we as a church missing out on sin that's going on amidst our body that needs to be addressed, that needs to be discussed so that we can name it and claim it and find victory. This will be a challenge for us because that is gonna rub our culture really difficult. Well, that person did that. I'm not responsible for that. Well, we just read over the last year the responsibility that we have as a church to bear one another's burdens, to speak truth in love, to walk into 
difficult discussions on doctrine. This is our responsibility to love one another. Nehemiah feels this, and he understands this, and he understands the corporate nature of failing and shame and difficulty that the Israelites are in. If you want to begin to experience rebuilding and renewal, you've got to own your existing state. So Nehemiah, he responds, weeping and mourning for days. And then he begins with fasting and prayer. And he does this all before God. Look at the text for a moment and see just some of the things that he highlights about the nature and person of God in his prayer. He says in verse five, O Lord, God of heaven. Again, he's elevating. He knows that God is ruler and reigner. Oh, the great and awesome God. And then he talks about what he does. He keeps covenant and steadfast love. And then he highlights even more that God here, oh Lord, let your ear be attentive in verse 11. He understands that God is a God who's willing to listen. So he's doing all of this before his God, knowing the greatness of God, knowing the power of God, knowing that God is a God who makes promises and keeps them. And so he goes to the one person he knows he needs help from, and he knows he needs to make right relationship with. Nehemiah is the example that rebuilding and renewal need a foundation of prayer. Do you talk to God about the things that you face? When you are experiencing things that cannot, or don't seem like they can be fixed, what's your response? Is it prayer? Is it acknowledgement? I'll be honest, sometimes when I feel like things are getting uh, overwhelming for me, my first response isn't prayer, my first response is control. How can I control this? How can I fix this? How can I, I be the problem to the solution that's in front of me? And Laura will tell you, I am not the solution. <laughs> Most of the time I've created the problem. There's an opportunity for us to recognize that we need to go to a God who's working in all the things that are unseen, like we saw in the story of Esther, but is also working to help us experience the blessings of his covenant promise. And we see this in a very different way as we read the New Testament. We see promises from Christ. He says, in me, you're a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. If you are faithful to confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus tells us. Are we a people that are committed to going to him in this way? And amazingly, Nehemiah, as he builds this, this prayer and he, he acknowledges the person and work of God, in verse five, he, he moves from that into an acknowledgement of his sin, which is really important. He, he sets up God's high position and character, and then he highlights his own sin before an almighty God. So that way, there's no confusion of what has taken place or who he's offended and, and why they're in the predicament they're in. They understand they have sinned before a holy almighty God. And so he, he says, look at verse six with me. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. So he's saying, this is really important. Please understand. I understand where I'm at. I understand what I've done wrong. As a parent, I, I've said this before from the pulpit, there's such a difference when your kid gets caught and your kid it comes and confesses, Right? When you're like, hey, why is the toilet overflowing? What did you do? That's very different than, dad, dad, I need your help. I put too many things in the toilet, it's overflowing, right? There's, there's just, a, that's, you sound subtle, but it's actually a big deal. Nehemiah comes and he understands what he's done wrong. Lord, Lord, I need your help. 
Not, I don't know. Man, this is crazy that, that I don't know how this could have happened. No, he clearly understands. And so he says that he acknowledges his sin. And, and look here, he says in verse, at the end of verse six, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. He, and, and I love Nehemiah hears this report and he could have said, well, I, I'm in Susa, they're in Jerusalem. That's not my problem. Like they're, 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 they're a world away. No, no, he, he lumps himself in. He identifies with the people who are experiencing God's punishment. See, he's the cupbearer for the king, so life isn't terrible. He's living in the palace. He's not hungry. He's probably not overworked. The biggest thing he has to worry about is eating poison. Eh, that's something. This guy lumps himself in here with the people who are experiencing the most difficulty. And he says, I have sinned with him. We have sinned. And so which we have sinned against you an almighty God. And then he, he goes further and he says, even I in my father's house have sinned. What is he saying? He says, we have been a generation that has rejected your law. We have forgotten your teachings. We have forgotten your promises and your precepts. And we're not living for you. He acknowledges this. And so this reminds us that rebuilding and renewal require repenting. What is repenting? Repenting is acknowledging your sin and turning from it. It requires that turn. Saying I'm sorry isn't repenting. It requires that next step. That was wrong. I was wrong. I was doing that. I'm not gonna do it anymore and I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna start doing this, which is to honor and obey. Each of us needs to repent for all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are a mess. And we need to acknowledge that mess and turn from that mess. And here's what I love. Nehemiah understands that often we are responsible for the difficulty that we're in. I love that he doesn't embrace a victimhood mentality. He names it and he claims it. Yeah, my problem, I'm part of the problem, Lord. I have contributed to the, to the difficulty that we are facing as a people. So often, our culture, we will battle a culture that tells you you're awesome since the moment you're born. You're great, you're a princess, you're a prince, you're wonderful, you deserve servants and all these great things. You don't have to work for anything because everybody gets a trophy. And you know what? You're just entitled, and if you, if you mess up, it's, I'm sorry, it's my fault as your parent because I didn't, I didn't prepare you. It's not, you're, you're a victim. And, and so this, and, and, and I don't wanna minimize our hurt and difficulty, but I wanna maximize the responsibility that we have to see how we contribute to most of the things that we're facing in our life. God wants us to be responsible. I've said this many times from the pulpit. You are responsible for your spiritual walk. If you want to delight in the Lord, be responsible and go delight in the Lord. Go remember who the person and work of God is, that he hasn't left you or forsaken you, that he is with you in every difficulty that you face. And go to him and ask for strength. This is what Nehemiah does. Look at verse 10 through 11. He says, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success for your servants today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And so Nehemiah is making this petition. He's acknowledging, I'm gonna serve you, God. I'm gonna serve you, which means I'm gonna serve your people. 
my desire is that your people are brought into a right relationship, that we rebuild this nation, that we renew the devotion of this nation before you. And I wanna be part of that, Lord. He says over and over again, this word servant, I, be attentive to your servant, that your servants who delight to fear your name. So he attaches, I'm here to serve you and I'm doing that because I fear the almighty God of the universe. I acknowledge that. And give success to your servant today. So three times he postures himself as servant to God. Is that how we live our lives? Or do we live our lives saying, Lord, I need stuff from you. And so it's kind of like the opposite way around. Lord, how, how can you help me? How can you serve me? That is not Nehemiah's posture. Nehemiah's posture is that he asks God to use him for God's glory and the people's benefit. And this is the opportunity that we have in front of us, that we get to stop and reflect and ask, what's the state that we're in? Have we acknowledged it? Are we mourning it? Are we processing it? Are we taking ownership of it? And repenting to the Lord? Are we asking God for help that we can experience this rebuilding and renewal? Because this is my challenge to us. As we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, time where we gather and we once a month stop and we remember the person and work of Jesus. Are we remembering this work? See, the, the Israelites went and they rebuilt the temple so that they could worship. Uh, the temple was so significant. We'll get into this later on in the series. But the temple is the place in which they would go and they would meet God. The presence of the God would, of, would dwell there so that they could have access to him and have a right relationship with him. Well, because of Jesus, that's changed. The work that we're celebrating today has changed the way that you have access to God. So you don't have to go to a location anymore. You don't have to go to a priest to carry your sacrifice. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, you get unlimited access to God anywhere at any time. And this is such a big deal. So I want you to ask this question of yourself. Ask God to begin the work of rebuilding and renewal in your life because you are the temple of God. You are where God dwells. You are where God comes and spends time and meets you. Jesus said, I'm leaving you a helper greater than I and the Holy Spirit. We are here with the presence of God, the Spirit who is in us, working in us and working through us. Let's be a people that ask for that Spirit, that God, to renew and rebuild my life so that I may serve God and that I may make him known. And so as those who are serving come forward, I would ask that we just take a moment and we pray and we reflect that we have a God who understands our state. Like the Israelites who are suffering from broken walls and burned down gates. And Nehemiah heard that report and was filled with great compassion and empathy. We have a God who sees our brokenness and a brokenness that we may feel is unfixable. And he has said, I'm willing to come do a work so that you can experience both rebuilding and renewal. And so let's just take a moment and pray together this morning as we prepare our hearts to reflect on our good Savior and his amazing work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we come together and we get to hear of a leader like Nehemiah who came to you not with pride, in his own position or his own competence, but he came to you humbly acknowledging his true position, that he was a sinner in needing of your forgiveness, rescue, rebuilding, and renewal. Lord, I pray that as we read this book that we would be a people that see our need, that we would embrace that need and embrace that you are the need that we long for. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember that this gift that we are gonna celebrate in just a moment, the death, burial, and resurrection of your son is a free gift and that we get to live in the great hope of new beginnings, that we can experience that new beginning now spiritually and that we will experience that new beginning forever practically when you return. 
Help us to remember. In your name we pray. The other night I was uh, sitting out on our patio with some friends and it was getting buggy out and my wife came and offered us some bug spray. I said, I'm good, I'm okay. I don't need a bug spray. Man, that's a decision I've regretted for about a week now. And so she's came again later on this last weekend and I took that bug spray because I knew I needed it. Listen, this is a free gift that God gives us, but if you don't see that you need it, you won't take it. Your need is so great that somebody shed their blood for you. Let's be a people that understand that we are in great need and that great need is met. Jesus says this to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, this is my body, which is for you. 
This is the gift that he offers us. Whether you see the need for it or not, we have need for it. Let's remember our need and that he is a God who meets our needs. Let's do this in remembrance of him. In the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And we're gonna see the people in the book of Nehemiah, they understood covenant making. They understood that God is a promise keeping God. Nehemiah declared God to be so. And we get to know that this new covenant is a covenant that we're going to be with God for eternity. That our sins are forgiven. This is the promise that God makes for us. That he sees us, he understands exactly who we are, and he chooses to love us still. Let's do this as often as we drink it in remembrance of him. And as uh, the servers take a seat, we just have a few next steps for you. Uh, opportunities that we as a church get to walk together in next steps in 